Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everyone. My name is Lee Pucker. I'm the CEO of the Wireless Innovation Forum, and I'd like to welcome you all to the 22nd in our webinar series. Today's webinar is entitled Strategies for Deploying RF SOC Technology for SIGINT, DRFM, and Radar Applications. Um, I'll do a, a few brief uh, announcements at the beginning, and then I'll turn it over to our speaker, uh, who will go into the, the details of the webinar. So the start, um, the slides presented during the webinar are going to be available. They're actually in the handouts right now, but the per version that's in the handouts is uh, there's an error in it. So we'll, uh, we'll be making available a revised version of the slides um, later today. And um, when uh, you'll get a link to those uh, sent to you. We're recording the webinar. And so if you want to review it again later, it'll be available on the forum's YouTube channel. And again, when uh, you get to thank you for attending today, there will be a link to that in there. And if you have any questions about anything that we're, that's being presented today um, or anything associated with the webinar, feel free to email me, um, lee.pucker at wirelessinnovation.org. A little bit about the interface you're going to be using. Um, I'm assuming everybody's connected to uh, microphone and speakers or telephone for dial-in. You can minimize the interface that you're using uh, so that you can get it out of the way of seeing the slides by just using the little orange button there. Uh, we'll do questions at the end. And so if you have questions, type them as you go throughout into the question screen. And then at the end of the end of the session, then I will answer the question. Uh, I will ask the questions to um, our speaker and he can uh, answer them live during the webinar. And finally, with that, I'd like to turn it over to today's speaker. Uh, our speaker today is Roger Hosking. He's the vice president and co-founder of Pentech. A uh, little bit of an introduction. Oh, my notes went away. Um, Roger, I'll ask you to introduce yourself then. Um, so I'll turn it over to Roger. Thank you. OK, thanks, Lee, for the introduction. And I'm going to. Uh light off my presentation now. So let me just make sure that works. Okay, uh, yes, uh, so we've been doing, um, this is our 32nd year in business, and we've been doing this kind of technology, that is coupling um, high frequency signals, typically uh, radio signals to uh, FPGA or DSP functions for doing uh, digital signal processing, otherwise known as software radio or software defined radio for a long, long time. And um, I'm, I'm one of the founders of Pentech and have been with the company since the beginning and have seen a, a whole range of different technologies being applied to this basic uh, area of the market. And I have to say that um, the RFSOC technology we're going to be looking at today has generated more interest than any other product that we've um, introduced over the last 30 years. It's a very intense interest from a lot of different uh, segments of the of the software radio market, uh, both military uh, and uh, and uh, defense, as well as uh, the commercial markets. So um, quite a right, wide range of interest, and I hope you'll you'll find the presentation interesting today. We're going to cover several different topics. First, for those of you who are not familiar, I'm going to introduce the RFSOC itself, which is a product of Xilinx, and uh, show some of the unique advantages that it has uh, and why it's so important. And then we'll take a look at, at some of the market segments. And then for people who want to build products, what are some of the design challenges for taking this very powerful chip and making it work in a real product? And then we'll introduce our approach to how we uh, go to market with this to make it easy for our customers to take advantage of the RFSOC um, product in a, in, a, in a modular form and how to migrate the function to different platforms, different form factors. And finally, we'll wind up with um, what are the uh, development strategies for the FPGA and the ARM software uh, before we sign off with a summary. So um, first of all, as you probably, many of you know, in February of 2017, Xilinx made the announcement of the RFSOC chip, uh, an integrated RF class analog with RF data converters. And basically they claimed it, and rightfully so, as a 
disruptive integration and architectural breakthrough for 5G wireless and RF class analog technology. So that was the announcement. And um, what's inside the RFSOC chip itself is, um, is a, a lot of different resources. It's an amazing collection. So first of all, it starts off with the 16 nanometer Kintex Ultrascale Plus um, technology for the logic cells, the DSP engines, the block RAM, and so forth. And then added to that um, are the advanced um, IO uh, functions, DSP engines. You have internal block RAM, internal ultra RAM, which is a, an enhanced memory, controllers for external DDR4 memories, a PCI Express Gen 4 interface, and then um, some very fast gigabit serial links that support the 100 gigabit Ethernet uh, Mac that's that's built right into the chip itself. So it's extremely um, well supported in terms of infrastructure for a lot of different applications out there. But that's not all. They've also, of course, added the A to Ds and D to As directly into the FPGA fabric on the same chip. And these are not just, you know, uh, modest devices. They are, in fact, um, uh, on the A to D side, 12-bit, 4 gigahertz uh, A to D converters with digital down converters. And then the uh, the DACs are 14 bits, 6.4 gigahertz, again, with integrated uh, digital up converters. They are connected directly into the fabric with low latency parallel interfaces. But that's not all. Also on chip, on board is a complete ARM-based processor system uh, with all of the processor I.O. Uh, signals that are typical to, for example, a, a processor controller for a, uh, a real-time system. Inside the processor system section includes a, a quad-core uh, ARM Cortex-A53, a dual-core uh, Cortex-R5, a uh, memory controller, a system controller, security manager, platform management unit, and, and a lot of connectivity so that the chip can be connected to the outside world using um, you know, USB and SATA and PCI Express and, and gigabit ethernet for connectivity to the outside world. So all of this, uh, all of these resources are uh, in, on, on the chip and the FPGA fabric itself has direct connections to DDR4 memories, 100 gigabit ethernet, the GPIO for parallel and GTY for the serial, gigabit serial links. So what you've got is a complete subsystem on a single monolithic chip, eight inputs, eight un outputs for RF, uh, and all everything that we've just talked about. So as you will probably agree, it's quite a remarkable achievement uh, that Xilinx has, has presented for, for our use. So let's talk just quickly about latency, which is quite important to many different applications. And I think most of you know what it is, but basically it's, it's a delay. Uh, and, and the delay not only within an element, like an A to D converter, but between the elements. And so these delays can be a critical limiting factor, now more so in the links between than in the devices themselves. Why is that? Well, traditionally, devices like A to Ds were connected to FPGAs with parallel LBDS uh, lines. And the nice thing about that method is that it's very simple and it's very low latency, but it has some limitations. It's limited in speed, and it also causes many lines to be required on the PCB, especially as the A to D converters uh, get faster and faster and get into the gigabit range, those LVDS lines have to be demultiplexed. And so it, it winds up adding a lot of PC traces and a lot of connections and a lot of pins uh, on the FPGA that are consumed for that parallel uh, method of connection. So to solve those, uh, those limitations, uh, a new serial standard, not, not that new, it's been out for, for many years, is the JESD 204B. And here, what we're doing is converting the parallel connection into a very high-speed serial gigabit connection, uh, often called JESD or JESD 204B. The advantages are that, that this, the JESD can handle high-speed A to Ds, 
and it requires fewer lines to route on the PCB and fewer pin connections to the devices. The problems are, though, that it does introduce latency, that serialization requires a protocol, and it also requires um, a engine on both the transmit and the receive side to implement. So it's a much more complex interface. Once it's working, uh, it works fine, but often it takes uh, quite a bit of work to get it going. So what the RFSOC does is it really takes the best of both of these because what it does is it uses internal parallel data converter interfaces inside the RFSOC chip from the data converters directly into the FPGA fabric. So what you get is the benefit of the simple and low latency of the parallel connection, but you also get the, the ability to handle high speed A to Ds and of course, because everything's internal to the RFSOC chip, there are no lines on the PCB uh, to connect them. So it makes it quite simple. So in fact, the RFSOC eliminates all the cons of both the parallel and the serial connection. It kind of gives you the best of both worlds. And uh, it, it's, it's quite a nice achievement. So you might ask, well, who cares about latency? And some applications are just not affected by latency at all. For example, if you're doing a recording, you don't really care if there's a little extra latency uh, in the connections. Once the, the file's recorded, it's, it's done and, and saved on the, on the drive. But there are a lot of applications, for example, uh, most notably countermeasures, where let's say you, you're building a radar jammer, which has to receive a signal and then do something to it and send back another signal that, that tries to defeat uh, a radar system from detecting your plane, for example. So this, in this case, the latency is very important. The good news is that regardless of whether or not latency is, re is important to your application, the RFSOC covers all applications for all latency requirements. So let's take a look now at some of the market opportunities that have been identified uh, by Xilinx uh, for the RFSOC chip. Um, Multifunction phased array radar. Um, this is also you know, for commercial weather and, and commercial radar networks, but of course also a lot of different military and defense um, applications uh, are very interested in, in the radar. EW and countermeasures, again, that's a very key uh, part of the low latency uh, advantage that RFSOC brings to the table. Communications, if you have a lot of channels and you need a lot of, uh, say, high density, so for SATCOM, for military and airborne radios, for monitoring, interception analysis, and SIGINT, and then 5G wireless, where you, de you do need the massive MIMO uh, structures uh, you need to be able to receive and transmit and of course with eight A to D's and D to A's uh, on a single chip that can uh, greatly simplify some of the hardware involved in uh, in the 5G wireless. So how does RFSOC really change the market? Well first of all it's quite efficient in terms of space. If you take the components that are within the RFSOC chip itself and compare the discrete implementation of those functions, you'll see that it takes about 50% less uh, size and footprint compared with those discrete devices. It also drops your power by about 30 to 40% because a lot of the power in the interconnections that otherwise would be taken with discrete devices is not required uh, because it's all on the same chip in the RFSOC. And that does lead to cost savings as well. It's just more efficient, uh, fewer parts to, to purchase and interconnect. They're all on the same monolithic device. And then finally, as we've said, latency is, is greatly reduced uh, over uh, these discrete solutions where uh, the A to Ds and D to As that are shown down there to the left are, would almost always be um, JESD because um, but that's that's the most common way of implementing the gigabit, the gigas sample per second data converters that are on the marketplace today. But what are some of the challenges in using the RFSOC? As a board level designer, 
you've got signal integrity issues. You've got 16 analog RF signals, uh, 8A to Ds, 8D to As with gigahertz bandwidths. You, you have the possibility of picking up spurious signals. You have crosstalk uh, possibility and signal path integrity and, and matching impedance. So designing a printed circuit board that, that, that keeps all of those signals very clean, even though they're right in the midst of a very heavy digital circuitry, uh, is is a tough thing to do. And then the signal path integrity for the high-speed gigabit serial links that are at 28 gigabits um, to support the 100 gigabit Ethernet um, connections, these require extremely careful print circuit board layout uh, maintaining uh, in, impedance and going through uh, uh, paths like connectors and so forth that can often uh, uh, compromise some of your uh, performance. And then clocking, clocking the, the data converter sample clocks, clocking the, the FPGA fabric, and then the gigabit serial links uh, can also be kind of a major design issue and take up some a lot of time in terms of, of uh, doing your, your board design. And interestingly, um, the RF SOC chip requires 13 different power supplies, and some of them have to be extremely clean. The analog supplies have to be extremely clean in order to maintain the signal fidelity and dynamic range of the uh, RF signals in and out. And then last, in, in, in the uh, thermal management, how do you, how do you uh, take the heat from uh, the, the device and um, dissipate it appropriately? So these are all issues that anyone who's taking the chip and wants to design a board is going to have to address. So what we're trying to present today is an idea of, let's say you love all of the advantages of the RFSOC chip, how do you get from the chip into a deployed product in the shortest path? What are some of the hardware strategies? What are some FPGA design strategies? How do you do software development, FPGA development? And how can you get a, a running start, say, on your competition so you can get an RFSOC-based product to market as, um, as efficiently and as early as, as possible compared to your competition? So <clears throat> we have some strategies, and we're going to introduce the, the big strategy, which is the RFSOC module concept, which we call Quartz XM. Now, this is um, kind of inspired by traditional modular mezzanine designs that we've been working with for years and years, where you have a main board and then you have a module that attaches to it, like our Jade, uh, Onyx, and Cobalt XMC modules have small uh, daughter cards that have um, A to Ds and D to As. And FMC is another standard that um, uses the uh, FMC module to contain A to Ds and D to As. So the, the practice of using mezzanine cards is has been in the industry for uh, many, many decades. It's not new. So inspired by that concept, we said, let's make a small module, a small mezzanine module that contains all of the infrastructure required for the RFSOC chip itself, but is a, an extremely small form factor that allows you to take advantage of those features of the chip without having to worry about all of the very difficult design challenges in making a board. So this chip is four inches by two and a half inches. Uh, it's not a chip, it's a module, and it is uh, an extremely efficient in terms of space and uh, laid out uh, very responsibly. But what, what really goes into this, it, it, the idea is to simplify your uh, design effort to get RFSOC technology into your product. We have connectors that preserve all of the RF signals and the gigabit serial signals uh, as well. One 12 volt input to this module generates all 13 RFSOC power supplies. So it simplifies that power supply generation dramatically. It has flash and DDR4 memories to support both the FPGA fabric as well as the ARM processor that's on board. It maintains all of the constraints and design rules for the printed circuit board for bypassing, filtering, size, uh, line spacing, and so forth. It includes clock management, uh, health monitoring facilities, and it really is a great way for you to get 
um, the RFSOC into a very small custom space that um, you know would be difficult for you to do uh, without the module. Some of the technical details of the the uh, Quartz XM, as as we call it, uh, XM stands for Express Module, and Quartz is a kind of a trade name for the uh, product line based on RFSOC. Uh, you can see the uh, some of the technical details. Um, it's quite a quite a complex 28 layer board with some really advanced fabrication techniques to achieve everything that we needed to make make the chip run uh, at its optimum. So if we take a look inside what's inside the the Quartz XM Express module, it really uh, we've talked about it. We're going to just highlight the the pieces of it here. Uh, there's a power management, there's clock management, there's two banks of DDR4 SD RAM, one for the FPGA and one for the processor. There's flash memory, and then the, there are connectors, uh, and the ones we're highlighting right now are the RFSOC connectors, which uh, use a very, very uh, good um, RFSOC uh, multi-pin connector made by, um, by Samtech. And we also use uh, very high-speed digital connectors for the clocking, as well as for the other I.O., including the serial uh, connections that, that go in and out of the board. So it's really a, um, a, a quite a very carefully designed co combination of different features that give you this complete solution all in a very compact uh, module. So how do you do development? for Quartz XM, the module? Well, one of the first and most popular platforms in the embedded space uh, is VPX. And VPX um, would be a great first platform for taking the Quartz XM into a deployed standard open architecture backplane uh, uh, standard like VPX. So uh, VP, VPX also has a lot of standards that are very appropriate for the RFSOC, for example, it has a very well-defined optical backplane standard called VITA 66 that gives you the ability on a 3U VPX module to bring the optical gigabit serial connections out to the backplane and between boards or to another system. We also have uh, connections uh, on the backplane for uh, RF signals with signal bandwidths up to 40 gigahertz using the Vita 67, which is a coaxial RF backplane IO standard. And then Vita 65 and Vita 65.1 uh, uh, are the open BPX standard. That's really the, the most popular standard that's now being used for, for deployed mill aero systems. Uh, there's new there's profiles that support all of these new uh, extensions. Uh, there's support for uh, synchronization, radio backplane clocks, reference clocks, and um, it's a really great environment to uh, deploy these um, high-performance um, digital signal processing products for the embedded market. So what we did, we created a carrier for the Quartz XM in a 3U VPX form factor. This is called a 5950. So here is the 3U VPX board. We install a RFSOC Quartz XM module on it. And now it's an open architecture board compliant with uh, open VPX. It has all of the backplane connections according to the VPX standard. It takes advantage of the Vita 66.4 optical serial backplane for the um, 100 gigabit ethernet links that we provide. It has uh, front panel connections for the uh, RF in, out, and clock. And it gives you a, a very complete 3U VPX modules, a complete functional subsystem with uh, everything then compatible with the open architecture uh, standard 3U VPX or open VPX. Inside, you can see the um, carrier here is outlined in blue. This is a picture of it in the upper right. This is the, the 3U VPX board. And central, uh, outlined in red, is shown in both views, is the uh, Quartz XM module, which then is connected up according to the, the lines that you see here to the appropriate interfaces on the 3U VPX carrier. 
We also have a rear transition module, which is part of BPX, that allows you to bring system I.O. from the ARM processor to the back plane, the back of the chassis, for connections to things like uh, gigabit Ethernet, uh, USB, display port, and so forth. And this is a very convenient way for you to get those connections out to the rear panel. We have both air and conduction cooled versions of the 3U VPX uh, product. And for development, uh, we've uh, arranged with um, a partner to provide a single slot 3U VPX development chassis that allows you to put that 5950 3U VPX quartz uh, board uh, into that slot. And it gives you all of the cooling power, um, uh, power supply, and so forth, the backplane that you need to support it. The front panel goes in on this side in the front, and that includes all of your RFIO, clocks, timing, and so forth. And then the rear panel uh, transition, the rear transition module is on the rear panel, and you can see that supports the ARM processor I.O. And then there's a MTP optical connector that supports the dual 100 gigabit Ethernet. So this gives a very nice, um, ready-to-run development ch chassis for doing RF SOC development. So if we take a look at that RF, um, I'm sorry, take a look at the um, rear transition module. This is a blow up of it. And for you to do development or connect to other parts of, of the system, what you can do is connect up in different ways. You can connect up over RS-232. You can connect up over JTAG. You can connect up over Gigabit Ethernet. All of these scenarios are valid development connections that support the tools that are uh, provided uh, by Xilinx and uh, by Pentec, uh, the Vivado tools and the Navigator tools from Pentec, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But it's, it, it's a very, very convenient, ready to use, ready to start development uh, strategy for for the RFSOC itself. Let's talk about going to other platforms. We, we looked at going to the um, 3U VPX, but the whole idea of the Quartz XM uh, module is that it's, it's capable of migrating to other platforms. So for example, um, there is a, um, a collection of people who would uh, like to use backplane for the RFIO using that Vita 67 standard that we talked about. So instead of coming out through the front panel, what you can do is build a different carrier, a different 3U VPX carrier that brings those uh, analog RF signals instead out to the backplane using the Vita 67. You keep the same Quartz XM module, but just have a different uh, mechanical arrangement on on the carrier board itself. The nice thing about having all of the RFIO on the backplane is that it really reduces um, uh, system integration by getting those cables off uh, the front and um, saves also in, uh, in any um, reliability issues that are associated with the cables on the front. So this is one uh, alternate platform for the Quartz XM. Another is a PCI Express carrier. This allows you to take the Quartz um, XM module and plug it right into a PC for a low cost development platform. This is on our roadmap, will be coming out in the next few months. This is great for doing your software or FPGA development because it's a low cost platform. And it's also good for continuation engineering and support in case you're deploying a 3U VPX version, you can do a lot of the, the uh, development and, and continuing as, continuation engineering on a low cost PC. And this also is extremely suitable for uh, benign environments for your deployed system. So if you don't have a, you know, a military, you know, hazardous, difficult environment that you need to go, but you can tolerate a laboratory environment, this would be great uh, to save money and to, to have a low cost platform with the same technology on a PC. But you can also go to other platforms. Um, this is the uh, a path, if you want, of how that could be done. You could start 
with the standard 3UVPX module, or you could start with the PCI Express, but just to start with our, one of our standard products and then develop all the software and IP for your custom form factor application. Then you build a carrier for the Quartz XM module using our uh, Quartz carrier design package. Now that includes uh, the pin definition of the module, the design rules, layout guidance. Uh, we will review your design. You attach the Quartz XM module, and now you've got the uh, RFSOC in a completely uh, different, unique environment. Perhaps this is a nose cone of some kind of a small aircraft or a, a UAV. But you keep your uh, the standard product as a development platform for doing the uh, other additional development work or your next project. Other uh, custom S uh, RFSOC solutions could include multiple RFSOC Quartz XM modules on a single uh, backplane. And this is uh, extremely attractive to a lot of customers who have a, uh, an array of antenna, antenna elements uh, that are located, uh, let's say, up on, on a mast uh, or in an aircraft, and uh, the RFSOC modules, the Quartz XM modules, can then have a very short direct path between the antenna elements and the RFSOC chip itself, which then, uh, with a little RF circuitry in between, can deliver digitized versions and 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 in both for both receive and transmit functions to the elements of the. Uh, of the array, the antenna array. So this is an extremely attractive solution for a lot of uh, for a lot of customers. Again, this is this would be a custom design board using the um, the uh, carrier design guide that we provide as a as a kind of a cookbook for for uh, for meeting all the rules to make sure you're successful in uh, developing your custom board. Another idea would be to um, uh, have a small form factor remote box. This is another product that's on our roadmap. And here, what we're doing uh, conceptually is we're starting again with the 3U VPX board, but we're, we're creating a new board. We're modifying it to take off all of the VPX nests, if you want, of the board. And instead, we're going to install special connectors that would be appropriate for a small remote form factor, uh, small form factor remote box. So this then is installed in a suitable enclosure, a small form factor enclosure, and it could be mounted, let's say, up on the mast near an antenna. And this then forms a complete eight-channel RF transceiver subsystem, very compact, where you're taking uh, analog RF signals in and out directly to a uh, through a short path to the to an antenna and connecting down through the mast with uh, cables for power gigabit ethernet for com for control and then a dual 100 gigabit ethernet to uh, to deliver your payload data that would be digitized data coming in or transmit digitized data going out so it's a, a very nice strategy for um, getting getting the signal processing and the acquisition a lot closer to the antenna using a, the small form factor box concept. Now I mentioned the carrier design package. What it includes, it includes all the, the pin definitions of our module, the Quartz XM module, uh, 3D models, thermal profiles, schematics for our 3U VPX carrier, um, PCB stack up recommendations, that is the layering, the design guidelines and routing rules, um, operating system and bootstrap guidelines for getting started, and then additional guidance uh, from us to uh, review uh, the your design. And this does require an NDA because we want our customers to be able to use our XM uh, Quartz XM module with with our product. So what are some of the uh, development strategies for the FPGA IP? Well, it starts off, of course, you're going to require the Xilinx Vivado tool suite, which, which is, does support uh, the RFSOC chip itself and includes IP integrator, which is a graphical design entry tool that allows you to manipulate 
um, IP modules and connect them simply by clicking on uh, inputs and outputs of each module with a mouse, and it will automatically do that connection for you. Those modules are based on AXI 4 IP, which uh, uh, standard. Uh, this allows you a standardized way to uh, connect easily between modules that come from Xilinx, from Pentec, and from other third parties. So it really simplifies design. You can also use high-level synthesis, um, generating RTL from C or C++. There's a, a simulator to verify the design, and there's a tool command language, a scripting language that, that's part of their tool suite as well. The part that comes from, from Pentec is called the Navigator FPGA Design Kit, or Navigator FDK, uh, for the RFSOC. What it contains is a complete Bovado project folder that we use to develop the product as we ship it. So you have all the files ready for extending what we give you to, to your own custom uh, configuration. We also um, supply a full AXI4 library for all of the IP that we use with source code. So you can choose some functions that might not be in our product from the library and add those to the project, recompile, and get some new functions. We also include uh, resource modules that include DMA controllers, triggering, gating, timing, synchronization, 100 gigabit ethernet, and um, Kind of very important is we include some reference designs or examples that are very useful as starting examples for your particular application. And since everybody's doing something a little bit different, we decided to start with four starter applications that um, represent what a lot of people, uh, one of which would probably represent what a lot of people uh, would want to do. For example, the first one is a digital RF memory uh, with a programmable delay. Now this, this would be um, a great start for someone who's doing electronic uh, countermeasures, for example, where instead of just implementing a delay, you could implement some other signal processing function that could be uh, uh, appropriate for a countermeasure application. Another starter example is just an, a streaming acquisition engine where the data from the A to D converters is streamed out through a dual 100 gigabit ethernet. You can get about 25 gigabytes per second uh, of data across those 200 gigabit ethernet links. So while you, while you probably do some data reduction in the FPGA, uh, getting 25 gigabytes per second of going out uh, or even going back in in case you want to use the D2A is an extremely high speed connection uh, that could be very valuable and faster than most backplane connections uh, currently support at least through PCI Express. Another, <clears throat> excuse me, another example is a waveform generator where people want to generate, let's say, an outgoing radar pulse. And they have a um, uh, let's say they have a stored table that represents the waveform samples, and they, that table can come from memory, it can come from uh, PCI Express, it could come across uh, the 100 gigabit Ethernet, or, or we could even use an onboard chirp generator. This is a uh, uh, frequency sweep generator that's built right in to the example. So this covers a lot of different um, waveform generation type applications uh, for different different types of, um, uh, of uh, application spaces. And then lastly, we have kind of a, a multi-function or multi-mode acquisition uh, to uh, delay memory or to PCI Express or to 100 gigabit ethernet. This could be used uh, to implement, um, the, uh, say, a transient capture in the DDR4 memory. Uh, it could be used for um, acquiring data and processing it at the same time, perhaps doing a recording application and an, and an analysis application uh, in parallel. So that it's kind of a, a, a multifunction uh, example that could be useful to some customers. So what we believe is that these starter applications for which we provide full uh, source code and IP uh, can, can give our customers a good head start on what they're trying to do. 
As far as the software development for the ARM processor, again, Vivado, uh, Vivado does provide a, a RFSOC ARM SDK, which includes a complete um, design environment, integrated design environment. Uh, it, uh, debuggers, compilers, editors, libraries, device drivers, um, as well as the Xilinx Petal Linux operating system for the ARM processor, which also includes uh, Linux tools and, and utilities. So this is all part of the Vivado offering. And then Pentex Navigator Board Support Package, or BSP, gives um, a complete command processor to you. And we, we implement this as a uh, command processor so that you can send high-level API commands into our board from PCI Express or, or Ethernet, and we will interpret those commands and execute them. So you can uh, operate the board at a relatively high level. We include uh, a suite of tools, which includes the initialization, control, um, uh, the ability to control all operational parameters, C language libraries, full C source code, lots of examples, and device drivers for Windows and Linux. Last, we include a signal viewer utility that allows you to view signals that you've acquired, uh, say, through the A to D converters on a virtual spectrum analyzer and oscilloscope for time and frequency domain uh, inspection of the signals that you're, that you're um, acquiring. So as far as the command processor goes, that application, as I mentioned, is running on the, um, uh, the ARM processor. And what it allows you to do is to accept high-level commands, let's say across, uh, say, gigabit Ethernet, to, to, the, uh, uh, to the Quartz XM module through, in this case, uh, the VPX backplane and the rear transition module to get um, a high-level command function implemented. You can also do that same function across PCI Express. So per perhaps you have a PCI Express link that goes into uh, uh, across the backplane or is connected through an expansion chassis from a PC. So that again can be used to deliver high level commands, which we will interpret with the command processor. Uh, we offer these flexible options because people have different needs uh, and want to build their systems in, in a different way. Another nice part about the, um, the uh, 3U VPX, the 5950, is that often in a 3U VPX system, you'll have a single board computer that acts as the, as the system controller. And uh, it's often the, uh, usually the, the root complex of the system controller. But the Model 5950, our 3U VPX board, can be configured as a root complex. And so it can, if, if, if appropriate, let's just go back up here, it can replace the single board computer and save you the slot that the single board computer took and have, a, have the 5950 take over its role by virtue of the ARM processor running Linux and running as a root complex. and then. The other payload cards that you may have in your system would all be uh, uh, PCI Express endpoints or targets that would be then um, controlled through the root complex there on the uh, model 5950. So the whole thing uh, boils down to being able to save the cost uh, and the space and the slot that might otherwise be required if you had to have a separate single board computer uh, in your system. So let's just take a look quick summary here. The RFSOC chip itself from Xilinx, as we've seen, offers incredible uh, integration uh, advantages, uh, load latency, all the A to Ds and D to As. What our Quartz XM module does is it simplifies system design. It uh, gives you a small footprint for high density custom applications, and it preserves all of the performance of the um, device itself using using uh, connectors that can be used in a mezzanine fashion. We talked about the Xilinx Vivado tools for both FPGA development and the ARM processor. We talked about Pentec Navigator tools, uh, the, the uh, FPGA design kit and board support package uh, to do both the ARM processing uh, design development with those libraries and 
the custom IP development using our libraries and our existing starter modules that we that we talked about to give you a really good head start. And altogether, they, this this offering and these strategies really help uh, get you to market and get your development done uh, much quicker than if you were to try to design your own product uh, using the RFSOC chip as a starting point instead of the Quartz XM. So that's the end of the presentation. Um, of course, if you'd like more uh, information, you can visit our website uh, uh, and just go to the RFSOC section, which is very prominent. We have data sheets for the two products that we talked about. We have a white paper. We have a Pentech pipeline. This is our quarterly newsletter. It goes into some uh, strategies for deploying RFSOCs. And then we also have a live signal acquisition video that uh, shows signals being acquired on, the, on live hardware uh, that we, um, we, we took this summer, uh, showing us some of the really nice performance that we're getting in terms of uh, signal to noise and dynamic range. So uh, with that, I guess I'll turn it back to Lee. Are you there? I am. Thank you, Roger, for, hey. uh, for your presentation. Um, if folks have questions that they'd like to ask, please go ahead and enter them into your questions window. Uh, I have the first one to read you. Uh, Roger, how does licensing work for the FDK? Is it one per site? Uh, the, for the FDK, yes, it's, it's one, one per developer. So it's like a, 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 work, um, a workstation license. And that can be used for one project or other projects on many projects, but it's basically it's a workstation uh, development license. Okay. And there is no there is no runtime licensing at all. Okay. In other words, in other words, there's no per unit uh, license fee uh, associated with the products that you're developing. All right. Um, if there's other questions, please, uh, again, everybody, uh, feel free to enter them into the <laughs> enter them into the window. Uh, I just got a, a comment that came in that said, "Well done." Do we get college credit for this presentation? So, <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure, I'll, I'll be glad to send you a diploma. How's that? All right, there you <laughs> go. I'm, 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 <laughs> thank you for the compliment. <laughs> Uh, one question I had, I noticed with all those different power supplies coming in, um, mm -hmm. you're, you're running them from a single 12 volt supply. Um, what's, the mm -hmm. efficient, what's the efficiency on your conversion process there? We're, we're up in the uh, probably 95% range. Uh, so, I mean, these have been very, very carefully uh, designed uh, to be maximum efficiency. And um, the fact that we know exactly what the input voltage is and that we know exactly what the output voltage is, you can choose uh, devices that will operate most efficiently at, at those two known fixed points as opposed to having a, a very wide range input voltage uh, support. So it, uh, we put a lot of work into it and a lot of that also was done um, to, uh, to save the uh, you know, space um, because, because the uh, you know, so, some of the real estate on this board was was very uh, judicial, judiciously uh, allocated to certain functions, and um, we think we've done a pretty good job. Okay. Uh, next question that's come in: Does Pentech support customer embedded designs, albeit smaller form factor than the Pentech Quartz, as beta developments that might leverage portions of the uh, baseline Quartz XM design? That's a, in other words, what you're saying is, could we could we sell you a development kit that included the Quartz XM and have you use that as a, uh, a launch pad for doing an even smaller uh, custom design of your own? I, if, if I understand it correctly, and I guess we would certainly uh, we certainly would would want to talk to you about that. Um, we want to sell Quartz XM modules. But if we can work out a, uh, a suitable licensing agreement, if you want to go manufacture something that's derived from the Quartz XM, um, we would certainly welcome that, uh, uh, that discussion. Okay. Uh, the next question that came in, what are the AXI4 functions you mentioned? How do they differ from the Xilinx IP? Okay, we have a lot of our AXI4 library is uh, centric to uh, the signal processing uh, 
uh, requirements that we have for, for our customers' applications. For example, um, uh, clocking uh, synchronization of multiple A to D channels, triggering, gating, um, delayed triggering. These, uh, the, a lot of these things have to do specifically with real-time uh, software radio applications uh, and not necessarily will be found in any Xilinx uh, collection of, of libraries. So we have DMA controllers that are uh, extremely well tuned to uh, move data from our uh, module across PCI Express, for example, in a very efficient way. And again, that, that was carefully designed and developed by us with a suitable FIFO buffering and so forth uh, so that we can stream data as efficiently as possible for a particular uh, product. And um, some of our DMA controllers are optimized differently depending on the data rates. The other thing we do is we use these, these structures in our recorders where, where the job, job one is really getting the maximum recording rate uh, from our modules uh, onto uh, a rate array. And so a lot of the, the techniques that we've developed and the, the IP that we've developed uh, for the recorders and for our board level products um, are very unique to Pentech. Uh, we've got uh, digital up converters, digital down converters uh, with uh, special features, um, interpolation filters, um, other, other kinds of structures in our, in our software radio uh, uh, products that are in the library and not all of them, of course, are used in any one product, but customers can take our library and choose modules that are there uh, and bring them into the project and recompile to include those project, those those modules, those functions uh, as a as a new as a new design, a new configuration. Okay. Um... Roger, I've gotten a couple of questions about pricing. I'm not going to bring those up here, but what I can do is uh, forward those to you, and you can perhaps follow up uh, on the pricing questions offline. Absolutely, we welcome any any require any requests in that nature, of course. Okay. Uh, the next question is: Are all analog input signals to the Quartz XM assumed to be at A to D baseband, i.e., FS over two? They, we are, have characterized the A to D inputs in both the first and which is, which is zero to FS over two, and in, in the second Nyquist zone. And um, we are just finishing up a report showing the uh, performance of the uh, of the A to D converters in, in both the first, second, and I believe they they're even uh, doing some in the third Nyquist zone. So um, so the answer is. There's, um, there's, they are, the RFSOC is definitely useful in uh, beyond the first Nyquist zone, and we have taken some measurements to, to uh, show and prove that that's so. Okay. There's a related question. What is the 1 dB passband cutoff frequency response? I believe uh, it's, it's above 6 gigahertz. But um, I'll have to check that. That's a spec I just don't happen to have in the top of my head. We use we use very wideband balance um, uh, between the uh, the RF connections on the front panel of our 3U VPX module and the uh, Quartz XM module. And the Quartz XM itself uses um, the Samtech ISO rate connectors, which are um, which are rated well above six gigahertz. Um, so uh, it depends on whether you're using the 3U VPX board or you're using the Quartz XM module itself. Um, but we've done everything to preserve um, a very well-controlled impedance path, a very, very high bandwidth by using the best connectors we could find. Okay. Uh, next question. Any RX to TX latency numbers uh, in the report? That it will be in the report, and this report is just being compiled, but th that information is in the report, yes. Okay. Uh, next question. Are the balance, uh, I'm guessing that word is critical, to getting uh, signals through the backplane? Uh, the, the signals, okay, I understand. Yeah, in case you're using the Vita 67 backplane connections, uh, instead of having the balance uh, uh, then going out to the front panel of our 3U VPX carrier, they would be 
located in a different physical position so that we would connect up with the coaxial RF um, inserts that go into the Vita 67 um, backplane housing. And those, again, are also rated for, uh, I believe, at least 10 gigahertz, and some of them can go up to 40 gigahertz in terms of signal bandwidth. So it's a, uh, a repositioning uh, physically of where the balans are, but the balans would be in the signal path between the backplane Vita 67 coaxial RF connectors and the Quartz XM module that would be on the 3U VPX carrier. Okay, thank you. Um, next question, does Xilinx have frequency response test data for the zinc that we can assume for the Quartz XM input response? I believe we are, if, if not completely uh, compliant with their specification, at least on the XM module. It might be a little bit less uh, going through the 3U VPX board, but again, we've tried to keep everything um, capable of meeting Xilinx's spec for the Quartz XM module, so we're not degrading uh, their performance levels in, uh, in any way that, that, that we know of. Okay. Um... Oh, another question just came in. What are the maximum I.O. data rate limits for the Quartz XM Vita 66X optical backplane module? Okay. Uh, we did answer that. Uh, well, first of all, the, the, um, the, the um, optical links are rated for 28 gigabit or gigabits per second. And that is uh, implemented in our standard product with um, two since there, uh, there will be eight uh, lanes going out, they're uh, implemented as 200 gigabit Ethernet um, uh, links. And we have actually measured uh, data payload throughput rates of about 12 and a half gigabytes per second for each of those 100 gigabit Ethernet links, which gives you an aggregate of 25 gigabytes per second um, payload data going across. Not not raw, but actually payload data. So uh, that is, that's where we are and that's what we've measured, that's what's working. And uh, it's, it's really working extremely well with extremely uh, nice eye patterns um, all the way through to the uh, 3U VPX backplane optical Vita 66.4. Okay, um, that's the last question that we have. So with that, uh, why don't we go ahead and wrap things up? Uh, thanks again, Roger, for the presentation. Um, I, I know everybody who was attending uh, really appreciated it. Uh, again, for uh, those on the line, we will upload the uh, slides associated with this to the Wireless Innovation Forum's website, uh, the webinar page. You'll be able to get them from there, and we'll also be uploading the recorded version of the webinar to our YouTube channel, so you'll be able to listen in again. Uh, thanks for everyone for attending. Uh, thanks again, Roger, to you. And um, I will uh, see you all or talk to you all again at the next webinar that we hold. Thanks, Lee, and, and thanks for all of you who, who listened today.